Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sam Anthony, and I'm your host for tonight's lecture and book signing. On behalf of the Archivist of the United States, I'd like to welcome you to the National Archives. We are honored to have with us Frances Stoner Saunders as she will discuss her book, The Cultural Cold War, The CIA, and the World of Arts and Letters. A few points before we begin. When you first came in tonight, you received a program. We also have some calendars of events for May and for June. These are free. You may take them home with you, or you may sign up on the uh, sheet outside and have these mailed to your work or home address. Following tonight's lecture at 8 o'clock, we will have copies of the book for sale. Ms. Saunders will be signing books at the end as well. We will make time at the end of our lecture for some questions and answers from the audience. So why don't we get started? Frances Stoner Saunders comes to us from England, where she was born and bred in London. She graduated from Oxford University and then has worked as an independent film producer on such documentaries as the four-hour Hidden Hands, A Different Story of Modernism. Her short story, Big Things, was published in New Writing. Would you please welcome Frances Stoner Saunders. Uh, l let me start by apologizing for my slightly casual appearance, but uh, American Airlines have one of my bags <laughs> someplace. Um, so this is the best I could do. Uh, I, I was asked just now, and I think it's probably a good place to start, why someone who took a, an English degree at Oxford would possibly get involved with a story involving the CIA. And I have to say, uh, briefly, I shall describe the accidental journey that brings me here which is that, uh, nothing to do with the suitcase, by the way, uh, which is that in, uh, in the early 90s, I was researching um, or developing a series of documentaries uh, for independent television in England, um, whose motivation, I suppose, or the animating spirit of which was to discover uh, a different way of telling the history of modernism in the 20th century. And we wanted to, to take art history out of the story for, for a while and, and look at the sociological or the political or the spiritual influences um, on 20th century avant-gardism. And in the midst of this rather kind of inchoate research, I was sent an article by Eva Cockcroft, which was published in 1974, which turns out to be a, a seminal piece. And the title was Abstract Expressionism, the CIA, uh, Weapon of the Cold War. And I figured what on earth has Jackson Pollock got to do with Cold War politics? Um, to cut a long story short, I went ahead and made a documentary which investigated the rumor that there was more than just an implicit link between the success of abstract expressionism in Europe, um, and indeed domestically, and American foreign policy objectives during the Cold War. That's how I got into the story. Um, as in all documentaries, half of the really good material you have is on the cutting room floor. And I felt that, uh, you know, I had the book already, I should just go ahead and write it. And three years later, I realized that was uh, astonishingly naive. And uh, after spending a good part of, you know, one and a half to two years in archives in Abilene, Kansas, and your national archives here, um, and just about everywhere else in the States, I realized that I had a, a, a much bigger story than I had anticipated. So I spent the next year and a half writing it, and this is the result. Now what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to read a, a, a talk which is um, really a kind of overview, a precy, of, of the claims of the book and also some of the questions that it raises. And I think then we can, we can go to some questions and, you know, if it's lacking in detail, uh, you know, please feel free to ask me to flesh that out. In the spring of 1966, the British poet Stephen Spender wrote a letter to Julius Fleischmann, patron of the Congress for Cultural Freedom and president of the Farfield Foundation. These two bodies were the publisher and financial arm, respectively, of Encounter magazine, of which Spender was co-editor. Both billed themselves as privately funded, independent organizations committed to promoting intellectual and artistic freedom. But rumors had been circulating at every literary cocktail party in London, Paris, and New York that they were not quite as free as they appeared, and Spender now wanted urgent clarification. Was it true, he asked Fleischmann, that the Congress and the Farfield Foundation were financially beholden to the American government? The allegation, he continued plaintively, was putting him in a terrible position as the editor of a magazine which emphasized its independence. After a delay of several months, 
during which time Spender's letter was passed from hand to hand in Washington, Spender received the reply he was hoping for. There was absolutely no truth to the rumours. Both the Congress for Cultural Freedom and the Farfield Foundation, in Fleischmann's words, had never accepted any funds from any government agency. Less than a year later, the hollowness of this denial was established. Fleischmann, heir to a vast gin and yeast fortune, was awash with money and had acquired the soubriquet, the Messinus of American culture, for his abundant largesse towards the Congress for Cultural Freedom and its multitude of offshoots. But he was also legendary for his personal meanness, the stingiest rich man I have ever known, according to one contemporary. Spender, too, had first-hand acquaintance of Fleischmann's parsimony. When his wife had borrowed a dime from Fleischmann to make a telephone call in a restaurant where they were dining, she had been urged, in all seriousness, to repay it. Junkie, as he was known, didn't forget his debts. The dime was certainly Junkie's, but the money he had been dispensing with such public generosity since the early 1950s was not. It was the CIA's. Fleischmann was simply a conduit, part of the famous pipeline that was pumping money to the Congress for Cultural Freedom and a reservoir of other organizations which served the US government in its covert battle for ideological supremacy in the Cold War. While Spender appeared content to broadcast the denial he had received from Fleischmann, others were less acquiescent. By early 1966, the California-based Ramparts magazine had already sent out journalists to truffle around in the undergrowth, undergrowth of the Internal Revenue Service, where the tax returns of philanthropic foundations revealed some bizarre discrepancies. There was the Hoblitzel Foundation, whose primary purpose was listed in the Directory of American Foundations as providing support to organizations within Texas, primarily in Dallas, with emphasis on aid for the handicapped. So why on earth was it funding the Italian magazine Tempo Presente, a publication of the Congress for Cultural Freedom? And what possible interest could the Miami District Fund have in the German magazine Der Monat, also published by the Congress? Ramparts was closing in on the CIA's crown jewels. For hiding behind frontmen like Julius Fleischmann and dummy foundations like the Farfield, the CIA had, from its inception in 1947, alighted upon culture as one of the central theatres of the Cold War. It was the secret Mycenas, the crypto patron behind thousands of books, literally. I think its backlist runs to over a thousand publications of books in which it was wholly or partially involved and scores of magazines, congresses and concerts, art exhibitions and seminars. At the close of the Second World War, the United States, the one outright victor, had suddenly found itself a superpower. Needing a culture to match, it stared over the wire at Russia, which had pursued intellectual politics ever since Catherine the Great, and set about acquiring worldwide intellectual admiration and support. As the Cold War froze and ideologies divided, the US government, through its intelligence and espionage arm, poured huge resources into a cultural propaganda campaign. A central feature of this campaign was to advance the claim that it didn't exist. The CIA was, in effect, acting as America's hidden Ministry of Culture. The centerpiece of the CIA's Kulturkampf, or cultural struggle, was the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Established in Berlin in the summer of 1950, the Congress was an apparently spontaneous alliance of intellectuals and artists committed to demonstrating the fallibility of the Soviet mythos and the superiority of Western democracy as a framework for cultural and philosophical inquiry. Its membership read like a who's who of the eminence gris of the period. Julian Huxley, Mircea Liade, André Malraux, Guido Piovene, Herbert Reed, Thornton Wilder, J.P. Narayan, Hugh Trevor Roper, James T. Farrell, Raymond Aron, Igor Stravinsky, Ignacio Silone, Roberto Rossellini, Willy Brandt, Ernst Reuter, A.J. Eyre, Herbert Reed, Malcolm Muggeridge, James Burnham, Sidney Hook, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., Arthur Kersler, Mary McCarthy, Diana and Lionel Trilling, Norman Thomas, Upton Sinclair, John Steinbeck, Alan Tate, Robert Penn Warren. It, the list is endless. I could go, sorry, it is endless. I've just realized it goes on and on. It even features Jackson Pollock, though he was probably drunk when he joined. Honorary presidents were Bertrand Russell, Benedetto Croce, John Dewey, Carl Jaspers, Salvador de Madariaga, Jacques Maritain, and Reinhold Niebuhr. Its achievements, not least its duration, were considerable. At its peak, the Congress for Cultural Freedom had offices in 35 countries, employed hundreds of personnel, 
published over 20 prestige magazines, including its flagship, Encounter, held art exhibitions, owns, owned a news and feature service, organized high-profile international conferences, and rewarded musicians and artists with prizes and public performances. Uh, amongst, to avoid another list, I'll just uh, amongst these were the Boston Symphony Orchestra, uh, Abstract Expressionism, the Mozartium Academy Orchestra of Salzburg, Tanglewood Music School, International Pen, the Philharmonica Ungarica, uh, the film versions of Animal Farm in 1984, Metropolitan Opera, <laughs> Berlin Cultural Festival, um, and many, many other organizations uh, and events were uh, indirectly, and whether they knew it or not, and whether they liked it or not, linked to the Congress for Cultural Freedom or, or indeed other fronts run by the CIA. This prolific activity made the Congress for Cultural Freedom a compelling feature of Western cultural life. From the platforms of its conferences and seminars and across the pages of its learned reviews, its members acquired an audience for their views which no other organization, except perhaps for Moscow's common form, could deliver. Just as Wright MacDonald so memorably described the Ford Foundation, the Congress for Cultural Freedom was a large body of money completely surrounded by people who wanted some. For the CIA, the Congress, codenamed QK Opera, was the prize in its propaganda assets inventory, a register of the fronts on which it knew it could rely. Known unofficially as Wisner's Wurlitzer, after Frank Wisner, head of the Office of Policy Coordination, the nickname reveals the agency's perception of how these assets were expected to perform. At the push of a button, Wisner could play any tune he wished to hear across the world. In early 1966, word reached the CIA that Ramparts was pursuing leads to its web of cultural organizations. Richard Helms, Deputy Director for Plans, immediately appointed a special assistant to pull together information on Ramparts, including any evidence of subversion, and to devise proposals for counteraction. By May, Helms was feeding the White House with the inside dope on Ramparts as part of a campaign to smear the magazine, its editors and contributors. Much of the information supplied by Helms had been produced from trawling through agency records. Additional dirt was supplied courtesy of the FBI. Helms, who was convinced that Ramparts was being as used as a vehicle by the Soviets, ordered a full investigation of its financing, but failed to turn up any evidence of foreign involvement. After reading through the Ramparts file, presidential assistant Peter Jessup penned a memo with a memorable subject line, a right cross to the left temple, which read, in view of Rampart's dedication to smearing the administration and the murky background of its sponsorship, one might think that some agency of the government would be pursuing the threads involved here. A week later, the magazine Human Events ran a smear under the title The Inside Story of Rampart's Magazine. Its journalists were dismissed as snoops, eccentrics, ventriloquists, and bearded new leftniks who had a get-out-of-Vietnam fixation. Signed by one M. M. Morton, quote, the pen name of an expert on internal security affairs, unquote, the article bore all the hallmarks of a CIA plant. As did a news weekly piece of the same week, Who Really Mans the Ramparts, and an article in the Washington Star, both of which announced serious doubts about the bona fides of Ramparts, which was described as not only a muckraker, but a muckraker with a malevolent motive. The CIA did everything it could to sink Ramparts. Quote, I had all sorts of dirty tricks to hurt their circulation and financing, Deputy Inspector, General, Deputy Inspector General Edgar Applewhite later confessed. The people running Ramparts were vulnerable to blackmail, he said. We had awful things in mind, some of which we carried off. We were not in the least inhibited by the fact that the CIA had no internal security role in the United States. Amazingly, given the awfulness of the CIA's intentions, Ramparts survived to tell the tale. Just as it feared, it went ahead and published its investigation into the agency's covert operations. The magazine's findings were swiftly picked up in national newspapers, and an orgy of disclosures followed, leading one commentator to conclude that, before very long, every political society, philanthropic trust, college fraternity, and baseball team in America will be identified as a front for the Central Intelligence Agency. At about the same time, a series of articles appeared in the New York Times exposing a wide range of covert action undertaken by the dark angels of American government. 
as stories of attempted coups and mostly botched political assassinations poured onto the front pages, the CIA came to be characterized as a rogue elephant, crashing through the scrubland of international politics, unimpeded by any sense of accountability. Amidst these more dramatic cloak and dagger exposés came details of how the American government had looked to the cultural Brahmins of the West to lend intellectual weight to its actions. The suggestion that many intellectuals had been animated by the dictates of American policymakers rather than by independent standards of their own generated widespread disgust. The moral authority enjoyed by the intelligentsia during the height of the Cold War was now seriously undermined and frequently mocked. The consensocracy was falling apart. The center could not hold. And as it disintegrated, so the story itself became fragmented, partial, modified, sometimes egregiously, by forces on the right and indeed on the left, who wished to twist its peculiar truths to their own ends. Ironically, the circumstances, therefore, which made possible the revelations contributed to their real significance becoming obscured. As America's anti-communist campaign in Vietnam brought it to the brink of social collapse, and with subsequent scandals on the scale of the Pentagon Papers and Watergate, it was hard to sustain interest or outrage in the business of Kulturkampf, which in comparison seemed to be fluff on the side. History, wrote Archibald McLeish, is like a badly constructed concert hall with dead spots where the music can't be heard. What I've attempted to do in this book is to record those dead spots. It seems to me that it's the duty of historians to seek a different acoustic, to look for a tune other than that played by the official virtuosi of the period. Gore Vidal, that wonderful charlatan, has described recent American history as a phenomenon where the agreed upon facts are not as numerous as professional historians like to think, obliging them to fictionalize anew those official fictions that have been agreed upon by altogether too many too interested parties, each with his own thousand days in which to set up his own misleading pyramids and obelisks that purport to tell some time. Let's not settle for the agreed upon facts then, but rather challenge them. This then in brief is the story I've tried to piece together by wandering through the misleading pyramids and obelisks. Drawing on an extensive, highly influential network of intelligence personnel, political strategists, the corporate establishment, and the old school ties of the Ivy League, the incipient CIA started from 1947 to build a consortium whose double task it was to inoculate the world against the contagion of communism and to ease the passage of American foreign policy interests abroad. The result was a remarkably tight network of people who worked alongside the agency to promote an idea that the world needed a Pax Americana, a new age of enlightenment, and it would be called the American century. The consortium which the CIA built up, consisting of what Henry Kissinger has described as an aristocracy dedicated to the service of this nation on behalf of principles beyond partisanship, was the hidden weapon in America's Cold War struggle, a weapon which, in the cultural field, had extensive fallout. Whether they liked it or not, whether they knew it or not, there were few writers, poets, artists, historians, scientists or critics in post-war Europe, and indeed America, whose names were not in some way linked to this covert enterprise. Unchallenged, undetected for 20 years, America's spying establishment operated a sophisticated, substantially endowed cultural front in the West, for the West, in the name of freedom of expression. Defining the Cold War as a battle for men's minds, it stockpiled a vast arsenal of cultural weapons, journals, books, conferences, seminars, art exhibitions, concerts, and awards. Membership of the consortium, which managed all of these activities, included an assorted group of former radicals and leftist intellectuals whose faith in Marxism and communism had been shattered by evidence of Stalinist totalitarianism. Emerging from the pink decade of the 1930s, mourned by Arthur Kersler as an abortive revolution of the spirit, a misfired renaissance, a false dawn of history, their disillusionment was attended by a readiness to join in a new consensus, to affirm a new order which would substitute for the spent forces of the past. The tradition of radical dissenter, where intellectuals took it upon themselves to probe myths, interrogate institutional prerogative, and disturb the complacency of power, was effectively suspended 
in favor of supporting the American proposition. Endorsed and subsidized by powerful institutions, this non-communist group became as much a cartel in the intellectual life of the West as communism had been a few years earlier, and it included many of the same people. There came a time when apparently life lost the ability to arrange itself, says Charlie Citrine, the narrator of Saul Bellow's Humboldt's Gift. It had to be arranged. Intellectuals took this as their job. From, say, Machiavelli's time to our own, this arranging has been the one great, gorgeous, tantalizing, misleading, disastrous project. A man like Humboldt, inspired, shrewd, nutty, was brimming over with the discovery that the human enterprise, so grand and infinitely varied, had now to be managed by exceptional persons. He was an exceptional person, therefore he was an eligible candidate for power. Well, why not? Like so many Humboldts, those intellectuals who had been betrayed by the false idol of communism now found themselves gazing at the possibility of building a new Weimar, an American Weimar. If the government and its covert action arm, the CIA, was prepared to assist in this project, well, why not? That former left-wingers should have come to be roped together in the same enterprise with the CIA is less implausible than it seems, at least to Europeans. Um, I think maybe Americans are much more familiar with this kind of paradox. There was a genuine community of interest and conviction between the agency and those intellectuals who were hired, even if they didn't know it, to fight the Cold War. The CIA's, the CIA's influence was not always or often reactionary or sinister, wrote Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. In my experience, its leadership was politically enlightened and sophisticated. This view of the CIA as a haven of liberalism acted as a powerful inducement to collaborate with it, or if not this, at least to acquiesce to the myth that it was well motivated. And yet this perception sits uncomfortably with the CIA's reputation as a ruthlessly interventionist and unaccountable instrument of American power. This was, after all, the same organization that masterminded the overthrow of Premier Mossadegh in, in Iran in 1953, the ousting of the Arbenz government in Guatemala in 1954, the disastrous Bay of Pigs operation in 1961, and the notorious Phoenix program in Vietnam. It spied on tens of thousands of Americans, harassed democratically elected leaders abroad, plotted assassinations, denied these activities to Congress, and in the process elevated the art of lying to new heights. By what strange alchemy then did the CIA manage to present itself to high-minded liberals like Arthur Schlesinger Jr. as the golden vessel of cherished liberalism? The extent to which America's spying establishment extended its reach into the cultural affairs of its Western allies acting as the unacknowledged facilitator to a broad range of creative activity, positioning intellectuals and their work like chess pieces to be played in the great game, remains one of the Cold War's most provocative legacies. The defense mounted by custodians of the period, which rests on the claim that the CIA's substantial financial investment came with no strings attached, is still largely unchallenged. Amongst intellectual circles in America and Western Europe, there still persists persists a readiness to accept as true that the CIA was merely interested in extending the possibilities for free and democratic cultural expression. We simply help people to say what they would have said anyway, goes this line. If the beneficiaries of CIA funds were ignorant of the fact, the argument goes, and if their behavior was consequently unmodified, then their independence as critical thinkers could not have been affected. This was exactly the line peddled by Gloria Steinem. Quote, the CIA's most important impact was that it made us unafraid to go ahead and do what we thought was right, she declared in 1967, when her own cover in the CIA-funded Independent Research Service was blown. It increased, not diminished, our freedom of action, she added. Gloria Steinem, said William Colby, former director of Central Intelligence, um, has, wrong, has been wrongly accused of being a CIA tool in her work. The CIA only helped her and others go to foreign political conferences where she presented the kind of independent, spontaneous positions and image that is truly representative of America's freedom. I should say William Colby went on the record with this quite a way back when I interviewed him shortly before he fell headlong into the swirling waters of the Potomac, although I can assure you my interview is in no way related. Um, he refused to go on record with this. Uh, this was said of the woman who was important enough to the CIA to be assigned her own case officer. Steinem was one of 250 students 
sponsored by the agency to attend youth festivals in Moscow, Vienna and Helsinki in the late 50s and 60s, and early 60s. Her relationship with the agency clearly illustrates how it moved from blank check support to operational use of its assets. The students were used for missions, such as reporting on Soviet and American personalities and observing Soviet security practices. One student attending the 1957 World Youth Festival in Moscow was instructed to report on Soviet counterintelligence measures and to purchase a piece of Soviet manufactured equipment. These details, by the way, were released in the Church Committee Report of 1976. Such operational use was not limited to students. Artists, athletes, leaders, and specialists in all cultural fields who were traveling to Europe under the auspices of the Fulbright Hayes Act, which expressly forbade political use of cultural exchange programs, were also frequently used. Funded openly by Congress, they were covertly deployed by the CIA. If Steinem felt that her freedom had been increased and not diminished by the CIA's involvement with her anti-communist activism, why has she refused for years to be drawn on the subject? Her 1968-69 entry in Who's Who lists her as a member of the board of directors of the Independent Research Service, yet subsequent editions make no reference to her directorship and reduce her period of employment with the service from three years to one. Another misleading pyramid. Official documents relating to the cultural culture. This was not simply an act of altruism. The individuals and institutions subsidized by the CIA were expected to perform as part of a broad campaign of persuasion, of a propaganda war in which propaganda was defined by national security directives as, quote, any organized effort or movement to disseminate information or a particular doctrine by means of news, special arguments, or appeals designed to influence the thoughts and actions of any given group. A vital constituent of this effort was psychological warfare, which was defined as the planned use by a nation of propaganda and activities other than combat, which communicate ideas and information intended to influence the opinions, attitudes, emotions, and behavior of foreign groups in ways that will support the achievement of national aims. Further, the most effective kind of propaganda was defined as the kind where the subject moves in the direction you desire for reasons which he believes to be his own. It's useless to dispute these definitions. They are littered across government documents, the donné of American post-war cultural diplomacy. CIA agent Donald Jameson intended no irony when he told me that as far as the attitudes that the agency wanted to inspire through these activities are concerned, clearly what they would like to have been able to produce were people who, of their own reasoning and conviction, were persuaded that everything the United States government did was right. It's not a question then of people being coerced into saying what they didn't believe. Uh, it's not a question of people writing articles for Encounter magazine or Tempo Presente or Quadrant or even American journals here like Partisan Review, which very indirectly received CIA funding at one point to boost its circulation. It's not a question of them simply uh, acting as simple you know, ventriloquists for the American government. On the contrary, it's about the inseparability, despite appearances to the contrary, of free behavior from institutional patronage. It's what you might describe as the inevitable relations between employer and employee, in which the wishes of the former become implicit in the acts of the latter. National Committee for a Free Europe, Crusade for Freedom, Free Asia Committee, Free Europe University, Radio Free This, Radio Free That, Congress for Cultural Freedom. In the mid-1960s, the joke was that if any American th philanthropic or cultural organization carried the words free or private in its literature, it must be a CIA front. Even the Farfield Foundation, many CIA uh, people that I spoke to said, you know, the jokey mantra inside the agency was, was to call it the far-fetched foundation, because by the 60s, pretty much everybody could guess who was behind it. Clearly, however, by camouflaging its investment, the CIA acted on the supposition that its blandishments would be refused if, opened off, if offered openly. Do you think I would have gone on the encounter payroll in 1956 had I known that there was secret US government money behind it? Dwight MacDonald angrily asked the man, CIA as it turns out, who had put him on the payroll. If you do, we are really out of contact. 
one would hesitate to work even for an openly government-funded magazine. I think I've been played for a sucker. Stephen Spender later thought it would be amusing to write a funny Gogol-like story about a man who, whatever he did, and whoever his employer, found he was always being paid for by the CIA. He should have known. What kind of freedom can be advanced by these deceptions? It was Harry Truman, under whose presidency the CIA was established, who before his death said, secrecy and a free democratic government don't mix. Freedom of any kind certainly wasn't on the agenda in the Soviet Union, where those writers and intellectuals who were not sent to the gulags were lassoed into serving the interests of the state. It was, of course, right to oppose such unfreedom. And I can't stress this enough. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, or I think in any reasonable person's mind, that uh, it was right to oppose the Soviet Union. But I think what I describe in the book is, is, a, is a larger picture than that. And it's right to oppose unfreedom, but I also ask the question, with what means? Was there any real justification for assuming that the principles of Western democracy couldn't be revived in post-war Europe according to some internal mechanism? Or for not assuming that democracy could be more complex than was implied by the lauding of American liberalism? To what degree was it admissible for another state to covertly intervene in the fundamental processes of organic intellectual growth, of free debate and the uninhibited flow of ideas in the countries of its allies? Did this not risk producing, instead of freedom, a kind of ur-freedom, where people think they're acting freely, when in fact they are bound to forces over which they have no control? The CIA's engagement in cultural warfare raises other troubling questions. Did financial aid distort the process by which intellectuals and their ideas were advanced? Were people selected for their positions, rather than on the basis of intellectual merit? And what did Arthur Kersler mean when he lampooned the international academic call girl circuit of intellectual conferences and symposia? Were reputations secured or enhanced by membership of the CIA's cultural consortium? How many of those writers and thinkers who acquired an international audience for their ideas were really second raters, ephemeral publicists, whose works were doomed to the basements of second-hand bookstores? How many others drunk too heavily at the trial? their creative energy sapped by the weight of their expense account. What most irritated us, wrote Jason Epstein some years ago, was that the government seemed to be running an underground gravy train whose first-class compartments were not always occupied by first-class passengers. The CIA and the Ford Foundation, among other agencies, had set up and were financing an apparatus of intellectuals selected for their correct Cold War positions as an alternative to what one might call a free intellectual market, where ideology was presumed to count for less than individual talent and achievement, and where doubts about established orthodoxies were taken to be the beginning of all inquiry. It had at last become clear how bad a bargain the intellectuals had made, that it could never have been in the interest of art or literature, of serious speculation of any kind, or even of humanity itself, for them to serve the will of any nation. It will perhaps be another 50 years before we discover whether the influence still exerts, whether the CIA still exerts influence over the cultural affairs of this and indeed other nations. On the lobby wall of the CIA's headquarters at Langley, Virginia, is engraved this from St. John's Gospel. The truth shall make you free. It's time it did.
would be in a relationship relevant to your employer-employee metaphor. And four, the extent to which the CIA actually affected editorial decisions in the magazine. And five, to what extent did the CIA influence the choice of music on programs performed by the Boston Symphony Orchestra? <laughs> well, I'm writing it down, so hang on. <laughs> okay, first, uh, did it uh, influence the uh, choice of writers? Um, what was the first one? Selected to, to write for the magazines. Okay, well, when the uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom was set up in 1950, uh, the CIA had a very direct influence on the personnel who were selected to, to run it. Uh, there was a man called Nicholas Nabokov, who was the second candidate put forward to be the, sort of the official impresario, if you like. Well, if you'd let me finish, I'll tell you. Uh, the first candidate was Louis Fisher, who was uh, not approved at Washington for a whole variety of reasons, principally because he was American and it was thought that he was, this made it too overtly kind of an American organization rather than a European one. Uh, you won't find Louis Fisher in The God That Failed, which was published in 1949, and you won't find him writing for any of the Congress magazines. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm not entirely clear what, what the agency's objections were to Louis Fisher, but he's not, he's not there. And as an anti-communist, as, as a prominent member of the non-communist left, at least in America, one might ask why, but there's, there are papers relating to uh, the choice of, of candidates for those roles in the early days of the Congress of Cultural Freedom, and the same applies to the editors. Um, as for writers, it was for the editors to decide, of, of the individual magazines, for example, to decide who they were going to commission to write a piece. Very rarely was anybody, uh, 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 you know, dropped because of orders from Washington. I mean, the point is that it wasn't necessary. These were people who were, who were uh, selected for, you know, for the correctness of their positions. You wouldn't have had an editor of Encounter magazine, which was set up in '53, who was uh, openly opposed to the, to the Korean War. It just wouldn't have happened. When I asked Tom Braden who set up the International Organizations Division, whether or not the CIA had a right to veto. They said that they did have a right to veto and that if someone had stood up at the Congress for Cultural Freedom in Berlin in 1950 and wanted to make a speech against the Korean War, they wouldn't have done it. I mean, they would have been vetoed. The point is that that, that right to veto was very, very rarely exercised, which you can take to be an indication, of, if you like, of, of, of how Washington, I think, was effectively happy with, with the uh, magazines and, and generally the kind of you know, publishing activities that it had uh, that it was funding. Dwight MacDonald's piece, famously in 1956, uh, which was submitted to Encounter, accepted by Stephen Spender, and subsequently rejected, accepted, and then finally rejected. Uh, it has always been said that the reason it was rejected was because it was a bad piece. It was a kind of instinctual rebuttal of America, you know, guided by Dwight's sort of, you know, nutty romanticism uh, for Europe, subsequent to spending three months in Tuscany, because that can, you know, turn anybody's head, as we all know. But uh, you know, the literature that I've, the correspondence that I found, um, speaks specifically of his points about Korea, and that uh, they felt that it was extremely bad and almost pro-Soviet propaganda to reprise the claims of Eugene Kincaid, who had written extensively in a commissioned report for the U.S. government of the collapse of morale amongst U.S. soldiers, prisoners of war, in Korea. This was information that uh, it was decided in Washington was not going to be published. That was the reason that article was not published. So when people say to me, well, you know, there aren't enough examples of, of, of articles being axed or of people being vetoed or of people being coerced, it's not about coercion or, or vetoing. It's about simply setting up uh, a, an organization of publications which have all sorts of cultural bona fides, which, by the by, publish, you know, memorable, some of the most memorable essays of the period, Isaiah Berlin's Six Pieces on Russian Literature, was published in Encounter. I mean, let's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, do a demolition job on the, on the achievements in terms of, you know, great argument and great pieces of these magazines. But, uh, you know, this was the cultural side of magazines that also had a kind of political agenda. Mm -hmm. Articles were well written. Writers <coughs> wanted to make a name for themselves, would have wanted to publish it. Is there evidence that uh, significant numbers of writers who didn't have the right opinions wanted to publish one of the published in Encounter, and were not. No, I spoke to a lot of people who, who, who didn't feature in Encounter, but who were sort of of the period, who told me they would never go anywhere near Encounter because they knew they wouldn't be published. That's, that's not a scientific answer to your question, but the feeling was, the, you know, Hugh Trevor Roper said in 1950, 
that he thought the Congress for Cultural Freedom was being backed by the Americans. He, he wasn't bothered by that. He went on to, he was with the Congress and he wrote many times for the uh, Fair Encounter magazine. But there were others who, who had the same feeling uh, early in the 50s and who were uneasy with it and who chose not to write for Encounter. Um, my point about, about all of this is it's not so much a question of um, editorial control, although it's clear that guidance was issued uh, at, at, at a certain level and was then passed down. I mean, I have many documents relating to guidance that was passed on to the editors. They could then fight it. They could then say, I don't want to do something about, uh, you know, uh, Highland dancing in Scotland because, you know, I'd rather run a piece about the European market, for example. But this was a, you know, clearly a give and take situation. These people were not patsies. Nobody's patsies. But what I would say to you is that uh, I think the Jason Epstein quote goes some way to describing what, what uh, uh, you know, members of the independent left in, in Western Europe felt, which was that they weren't being given a chance to compete fairly on a level field uh, in their non-communist activities with subsidized non-communist activities, which had grown into a kind of you know, sub-profession. You haven't read the book, uh, as you say, and, but I, I absolutely take your point, and I think that you know there is there is naturally a danger when you deal, particularly with you know some big names of sensationalism. And I've noticed in quite a few of the in, in some of the reporting of this book, and in some of the reviews by you know fairly prestigious reviewers, both for and against the book, that you know very simple mistakes have been made by misreading of what I say, and not misinterpretation, but misreading. People confuse the details that I give about the American military government's cultural programs in Berlin, all of which are available for inspection in, in the National Archives here, with later programs or projects that, uh, that the CIA were involved in, which had nothing to do with the American military government. I found that, that you know, the, the two case scenarios have been confused. Let's, let's talk about Fulbright. The evidence for the Fulbright comes from the, F the Church Committee report of 1976, and I recommend you read it. This was the most uh, uh, compelling and, and uh, serious analysis, sustained analysis, of uh, US intelligence operations. Um, anyone who reads this report uh, 
I think we'll come away with, with, a, with a clear feeling about what the distinctions are between, as you say, um, evidence and supposition or generalization. And I took the Church Report Committee as one of the kind of backbones, together with a couple of other committees' reports, including the Cox Committee Report in 1952, which is astonishing in its level of, of, of detail about the uh, CIA's intrusion into the field of philanthropic foundations and gives facts and figures, numbers of foundations involved, how much of their sp percentage of their spending was going to CIA projects. Um, I use those as a kind of, you know, backbone. And I think, you know, w one assumes that one can rely on congressional committee inquiries. Um, I interviewed people who had never been interviewed about this before. I was very careful not to use hearsay or allegation. I don't believe in, you know, I've read several books that deal with, uh, that deal with the communist fifth column in America in which it said, uh, there's been very recently been the publication of the Matrokin Archive, an, in, an invaluable historical document which has been published here in, in the UK in which people are named as KGB spies with absolutely no effort to talk to them, to ask them whether they have a response to the allegation before it's published and on the basis of what one KGB officer says. I didn't take on the basis of what one CIA agent told me anything to be de facto truth. If I had, you know, pieces of paper or other people who said it, you know, when you ask who knew, who didn't know, when, you know, 50 people tell you, I know that so-and-so knew because we sat down and talked about it and here's an exchange of letters we had in 1957 or whatever it might be, then, you know, there comes a point at which you have to make a decision about, about the nature of evidence, which, you know, and I agree, I think one should be, you know, constantly aware. But, you, you've got to be careful too, because your, your argument would suggest that, you know, there is no history. There's no way of writing into these, these complicated stories and trying to kind of, you know... Well, that's, I'm saying that's a confusion that I think could also arise by, by, by erring too much the other side. May I just follow up? Um, I'm not saying that, that I even agree with you, I mentioned several times, that there are some people that are doing that, okay? I do not disagree with that. I'm just saying that from a scientific standpoint, I think you need to come up with more robust scientific work. Yeah, I think with respect, you need to read the book before you say, I haven't researched it properly. That's, you know, we could make a general point about this, but not about the book. The point is that even assuming that the evidences are robust, how much can you generalize? Go back to the book again. I cannot read that. But I think I have scarce sufficient of the whole book to understand what you are trying to do. I don't think scanning is, is scientific way of researching, and it's not a scientific way of asking a scientific question. Especially the social sciences. Especially the social sciences. A lot of people have been using that on both sides to do work like this. Mm. You have to go to the left side, and someone can do that on the right side too. But I'm neutral on this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's say I'd like to ask an open ended question. But I'll put a little background to it. Uh, one, I will say, Robert Oppenheimer uh, became a member of the American Congress for Cultural Freedom in 1954 after he lost his security clearance there in the United States. Uh, he also, uh, I'll say, I know was involved with uh, Eugene Meyer's wife in setting up the Mount Kisco Conference up in New York for the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And just before Oppenheimer died, he was uh, uh, scheduled to go to Paris. I think he was then being appointed a director, or I think for the Congress for Cultural Freedom, and then he had to decline that because he couldn't attend. But can you comment anything on Robert Oppenheimer's role, I don't want to say in the Congress, and the significance of it, and how it was viewed by other members of the Congress? I think um, that uh, Oppenheimer's joining in 1954 was, was certainly um, viewed by members. He joined the American Committee for Cultural Freedom, um, and I think it was, you know, viewed as, 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 a, as a positive thing. Uh, I make very clear that the American Committee for Cultural Freedom, despite, despite its really checkered history, because it had appalling divisions, internal divisions, it was really split between kind of hardline anti-communists, there's a famous anecdote, uh, you know, of uh, Diana Trilling standing up at a dinner party and saying, none of you men are hard enough for me, and they're all kind of, you know, with her. But between the, between the, of the hardline communists, anti-communists in, in the American committee and the moderates, and this, this history, if you like, is something that I show through, through a lot of documentation, Arthur Schlesinger's papers and his own words on this matter are fairly revealing. So I think that Oppenheimer's joining in 54 was seen to be a, a very positive 
sign because it gave uh, a, a, an air and, and real weight to the American Committee for Cultural Freedom's title, which was that it was fighting for cultural freedom. Um, and as and as Schlesinger himself said after one particularly nasty episode where the, Congre the American Committee got involved in sort of harassing somebody or trying to get them out of their job, he said, you know, a, a committee for cultural freedom can never err in being magnanimous. So I think Oppenheimer's joining was, was certainly significant. In all of the um, American Committee for Cultural Freedom papers that I researched, and I researched what I understood at the time to be the full collection, which is in the uh, Tamament Library here in New York, although I'm subsequently told by Daniel Bell that some boxes have been held back. Um, but in the papers that I researched, there's very little mention of Oppenheimer. And I think he was one of those many members who, uh, who I do point out in the book. I mean, I mean there's clearly a distinction between activists who are, you know, involved in the day-to-day -day running of these committees and, and uh, the, their agenda and their minutes and everything else, and those like Oppenheimer who are, are members. I think later on there's a quote from Stuart Hampshire, the British philosopher at the end of the book, where he remembers talking to um, Oppenheimer in 67 once most of these exposures had, had, had come out, in which Oppenheimer took a fairly sort of sanguine approach, much like Isaiah Berlin, in which he said, well, you know, okay, it happened, so we kind of all knew about it, big deal. Which was, you know, the sort of laissez-faire attitude of, of many people. But I think, you know, in the case of Oppenheimer having not been, there may be people here who can correct me, but having not been directly involved in, in any of the sort of, you know, uh, organizational uh, running of any of these uh, programs was, was lending his name to an outfit, which I think fundamentally he approved of. assistant editor at Foreign Policy Magazine here in D.C. I was walking outside the building and there's an engravement on the building that says past is prologue, so I think it's incredibly appropriate that you're giving your talk here at the National Archives, where we keep everything that's tangible about our history. But given that background, I, you touched on this a little bit at the very end of your talk when you said it may be 50 years before we know if these kinds of things are still going on. But it's sort of become a cliche in cultural politics. You have the Americanization of, of global culture, and then you have the subsequent backlash to that, particularly in continental Europe. So I, I would like for you to cast your net a little farther if you can, and try to fill that disconnect between your book and what's going on now with the backlash and, and, and the Americanization of culture, and how you see the two related. I mean, I think you're, you're, you're right. I mean, the, the, the continental European perspective of, of this book, indeed, and of this story will be, I think, t to a large degree, different than it is here. I mean, you people are genuinely, even of an older generation to mine, are genuinely quite shocked or astounded, or, or even if they're positively sort of shocked, if you like, by, by uh, the extent to which the cultural Cold War was fought by America in Western Europe. Um, I don't think that this necessarily has contributed to a kind of a, a backlash or a rise of anti-American feeling. There's always periodically it's a kind of extraordinary cyclical thing that there's anti-Americanism, you know, surfaces and then and, and then, you know, ebbs away in Europe on on a cyclical basis. I mean, sometimes you can see it directly related, as in as in the mid '60s with Vietnam, to specific um, moments of ideological uh, tension or financial or economic tension. Um, I think that with NATO now, there's quite a lot of um, anxiety amongst Western Europeans about Americans, America's role in NATO, about whether or not uh, we want to be part of an organization that uh, uh, has such a strong American role. But there are people who feel equally strongly the other side. I think it's really hard to generalize. I think what's, well, what makes it very hard to generalize is that the kind of this very inchoate and sort of um, purposely, it seems to me, disorganized and unnamed Seattle, Washington, May Day in London, sort of, uh, you know, under the surface groundswell of opinion that seems to be against globalization and against capitalism and against any kind of sort of, you know, against the media. I mean, I think there you're seeing something of the kind of residual anti-Americanism that, that, you know, the, the new left in, in Western Europe felt in the 60s and 70s. But I think it's... I think it's sort of getting beyond left and right, which is probably a good thing. I mean, I really do feel that the kind of the ideologies, you know, that locked uh, the 20th century and this kind of, you know, steel embrace do seem to be shattering. What's alarming, of course, is to know, you know, if left and right is no longer, this, you know, if those sort of rather pious polarities are no longer relevant, what is? And I think that's why, you know, governments are, are now increasingly worried about, about these movements because they don't, you know, it's quite, it's not the new, new left, is it? I don't know, you know, it's not, it's kind of hard to define. Your book, which actually I'm about three fourths of the way through. It's a, I found it uh, to be an interesting compilation of the facts, and I actually found your evidence convincing. However, I have several uh, uh, 
with two main points of difference. First, as you noted in your uh, lecture today, you thought that the struggle, that, that the Cold War was a, wor was a worthy cause. And yet, I am uncomfortable in your book with the persistent subtext that there was some sort of moral equivalence here. Because I would first like to point out two things, that many of these artists were in the counterculture here domestically, whereas the Soviet artists were state-sponsored. And even cite one case in your book where someone dashed off a telegram complaining to his CIA overseers. Would any Soviet artist have been able to do the same? Probably not. Um, the second point is, as I said, I'm convinced by, by the evidence you present regarding the CIA involvement. And since I'm an economist, I was converting the, the dollar amounts into 1999 equivalents, and I was astounded by, by, the, by the size of the amounts. Nevertheless, don't you exaggerate the significance of CIA involvement in winning the cultural Cold War? Because what about the role of Hollywood commercial films, for instance? Because speaking personally, when I was growing up in Southeast Asia and I saw propaganda films from communist China, Neil Simon films simply were so much better than his propaganda films. <laughs> so isn't, isn't this uh, an exaggeration of the role of the Congress for Cultural Freedom that typical literary intellectuals conceive? I think this is I mean, a very valid point uh, that, uh, you know, one of the reasons I think the CIA, but for a brief kind of flirtation through one or two semi-agents in Hollywood uh, with, you know, the movie business. I mean, they knew this, this, this project, you said, no, I think the answer to the question is no, I don't exaggerate it. Because what I make clear is that what the Congress for Cultural Freedom represented was a serious alliance of intellectuals. Leave aside the institutional, you know, CIA background for a minute. Committed to uh, preserving high modernist achievements. They were not people who enjoyed, as, as the writings of, you know, of all of these individuals even now will show very clearly, who enjoyed anything of mass culture. They did not like Elvis, they did not like Blue Jeans. You know what one of their biggest fears was? If you read Irving Crystal now, one of his major fears was, was not that you know, people weren't going to read Encounter magazine or, or that the Soviets were going to Newcastle, we were going to New... There. It was that you know, Elvis and Blue Jeans were going to win the Cold War. And that that meant that even if you know, it was an American or non-Soviet victory, that uh, you know, the, 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 uh, those elite, uh, you know, high cultural values and ideas would not have won. And that's essentially what has happened. This was a kind of, you know, at one level, an incredibly heroic battle to try and defend high culture from, from, from the threat, not just of mass man in the totalitarian Soviet Union sense, but, you know, the famous ooze of, of mass culture in the, in the Dwight MacDonald, you know, it's here in America sense. So it was kind of a domestic battle there as, as, as well as, you know, just, just the, the dread and the, and the justified dread of the Soviet paradigm being imposed in terms of culture. It was evident here, right before their very eyes and noses. And this is something that, you know, they write about, uh, you know, compellingly now. This, is, this seems to be the real guiding project of, of their lives, actually, is this, is this action against the sort of, you know, breaking of the, of the floodgates and that, you know, the, the Philistines are, are, are inside. The, the propagation abroad was incidental, but the main project was this domestic. domestic no, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think the real, the real target was absolutely um, uh, uh, Western European intellectuals who were non communist but not necessarily persuaded that they wanted to be pro-American. So there was a distinction there. And there were certainly uh, the neutralists or the waverers. Um, who were at the third, you know, the so-called third way, which emerged, interestingly, out of the European movement, which in itself was heavily backed by the CIA. But it was, it was no, it was absolutely about, it was, you know, it was not just about opposing the Soviets. It was about also, and, you know, kind of um, creating a groundswell of, 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 of approval and asserting the merits of, you know, American culture in the post-war era. You know, if you have uh, an enormous imperial burden, which America had, which it had acquired, in the, sec in the aftermath of the Second World War, you need a culture to go with it. I mean, I think that's not, you know, I think it's just I instinctive, this is what happens. It Ladies and gentlemen, Francis Stoner. <laughs> 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 Thank you all very much for coming.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sam Anthony, and I'm your host for tonight's lecture and book signing. On behalf of the Archivist of the United States, I'd like to welcome you to the National Archives. We are honored to have with us Frances Stoner Saunders, as she will discuss her book, The Cultural Cold War, The CIA, and the World of Arts and Letters. A few points before we begin. When you first came in tonight, you received a program. We also have some calendars of events for May and for June. These are free. You may take them home with you, or you may sign up on the uh, sheet outside and have these mailed to your work or home address. Following tonight's lecture at 8 o'clock, we will have copies of the book for sale. Ms. Saunders will be signing books at the end as well. We will make time at the end of our lecture for some question and answers from the audience. So why don't we get started? Frances Stoner Saunders comes to us from England, where she was born and bred in London. She graduated from Oxford University and then has worked as an independent film producer on such documentaries as the four-hour Hidden Hands, A Different Story of Modernism. Her short story, Big Things, was published in New Writing. Would you please welcome Frances Stoner Saunders. Uh, let me start by apologizing for my slightly casual appearance, but uh, American Airlines have one of my bags <laughs> someplace. Um, so this is the best I could do. Uh, I, I was asked just now, and I think it's probably a good place to start, why someone who took a, an English degree at Oxford would possibly get involved with a story involving the CIA. And I have to say, uh, briefly, I shall describe the accidental journey that brings me here which is that, uh, nothing to do with the suitcase, by the way, uh, which is that in, uh, in the early 90s, I was researching um, or developing a series of documentaries uh, for independent television in England, um, whose motivation, I suppose, or the animating spirit of which was to discover uh, a different way of telling the history of modernism in the 20th century. And we wanted to, to a junior, Arthur Kersler, Mary McCarthy, Diana and Lionel Trilling, Norman Thomas, Upton Sinclair, John Steinbeck, Alan Tate, Robert Penn Warren, it, the list is endless, I could go, sorry, it is endless, I've just realized it goes on and on. It even features Jackson Pollock, though he was probably drunk when he joined. Honorary presidents were Bertrand Russell, Benedetto Croce, John Dewey, Carl Jaspers, Salvador de Madariaga, Jacques Maritain, and Reinhold Niebuhr. Its achievements, not least its duration, were considerable. At its peak, the Congress for Cultural Freedom had offices in 35 countries, employed hundreds of personnel, published over 20 prestige magazines, including its flagship, Encounter, held art exhibitions, owned a news and feature service, organized high-profile international conferences, and rewarded musicians and artists with prizes and public performances. Uh, amongst, to avoid another list, I'll just uh, amongst these were the Boston Symphony Orchestra, uh, Abstract Expressionism, the Mozartium Academy Orchestra of Salzburg, Tanglewood Music School, International Pen, the Philharmonica Ungarica, uh, the film versions of Animal Farm in 1984, Metropolitan Opera, <laughs> Berlin Cultural Festival, um, and many, many other organizations uh, and events were uh, indirectly, and whether they knew it or not, and whether they liked it or not, linked to Congress for Cultural Freedom, or, or indeed other fronts run by the CIA. This prolific activity made the Congress for Cultural Freedom a compelling feature of Western cultural life. From the platforms of its conferences and seminars, and across the pages of its learned reviews, its members acquired an audience for their views which no other organization, except perhaps for Moscow's common form, could deliver. Just as Wright MacDonald so memorably described the Ford Foundation, the Congress for Cultural Freedom was a large body of money completely surrounded by people who wanted some. For the CIA, the Congress, codenamed QK Opera, was the prize in its propaganda assets inventory, a register of the fronts on which it knew it could rely. Known unofficially as Wisner's Wurlitzer, after Frank Wisner, head of the Office of Policy Coordination, the nickname reveals the agency's perception of how these assets were expected to perform. It's in New York, that they were not quite as free as they appeared, and Spender now wanted urgent clarification. Was it true, he asked Fleischmann, that the Congress and the Farfield Foundation were financially beholden to the American government? The allegation, he continued plaintively, was putting him in a terrible position as the editor of a magazine which emphasized its independence. After a delay of several months, 
during which time Spender's letter was passed from hand to hand in Washington, Spender received the reply he was hoping for. There was absolutely no truth to the rumours. Both the Congress for Cultural Freedom and the Farfield Foundation, in Fleischmann's words, had never accepted any funds from any government agency. Less than a year later, the hollowness of this denial was established. Fleischmann, heir to a vast gin and yeast fortune, was awash with money and had acquired the sobriquet, the Messinus of American culture, for his abundant largesse towards the Congress for Cultural Freedom and its multitude of offshoots. But he was also legendary for his personal meanness, the stingiest rich man I have ever known, according to one contemporary. Spender, too, had first-hand acquaintance of Fleischmann's parsimony. When his wife had borrowed a dime from Fleischmann to make a telephone call in a restaurant where they were dining, she had been urged, in all seriousness, to repay it. Junkie, as he was known, didn't forget his debts. The dime was certainly Junkie's, but the money he had been dispensing with such public generosity since the early 1950s was not. It was the CIA's. Fleischmann was simply a conduit, part of the famous pipeline that was pumping money to the Congress for Cultural Freedom and a reservoir of other organizations which served the US government in its covert battle for ideological supremacy in the Cold War. While Spender appeared content to broadcast the denial he had received from Fleischmann, others were less acquiescent. By early 1966, the California-based Ramparts magazine had already sent out journalists to truffle around in the undergrowth, undergrowth of the Internal Revenue Service, where the tax returns of philanthropic foundations revealed some bizarre discrepancies. There was the Hoblitzel Foundation, whose primary purpose was listed in the Directory of American Foundations as providing support to organizations within Texas, primarily in Dallas, with emphasis on aid for the handicapped. So why on earth was it funding the Italian magazine Tempo Presente, a publication of the Congress for Cultural Freedom? And what possible interest could the Miami District Fund have in the German magazine Der Monat, also published by the Congress? Ramparts was closing in on the CIA's crown jewels, for hiding behind front men like Julius Fleischmann and dummy foundations like the Farfield, the CIA had, from its inception in 1947, alighted upon culture as one of the central theatres of the Cold War. It was the secret Mycenas, the crypto patron behind thousands of books, literally. I think its backlist runs to over a thousand publications of books in which it was wholly or partially involved. And scores of magazines, congresses and concerts art exhibitions and seminars. At the close of the Second World War, the United States, the one outright victor, had suddenly found itself a superpower. Needing a culture to match, it stared over the wire at Russia, which had pursued intellectual politics ever since Catherine the Great, and set about acquiring worldwide intellectual admiration and support. As the Cold War froze and ideologies divided, the US government, through its intelligence and espionage arm, poured huge resources into a cultural propaganda campaign. A central feature of this campaign was to advance the claim that it didn't exist. The CIA was in effect acting as America's hidden Ministry of Culture. The centerpiece of the CIA's Kulturkampf, or cultural struggle, was the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Established in Berlin in the summer of 1950, the Congress was an apparently spontaneous alliance of intellectuals and artists committed to demonstrating the fallibility of the Soviet mythos and the superiority of Western democracy as a framework for cultural and philosophical inquiry. Its membership read like a who's who of the eminence grise of the period. Julian Huxley, Mircea Liade, André Malraux, Guido Piovene, Herbert Reed, Thornton Wilder, J.P. Narayan, Hugh Trevor Roper, James T. Farrell, Raymond Aron, Igor Stravinsky, Ignacio Silone, Roberto Rossellini, Willy Brandt, Ernst Reuter, A.J. Eyre, Herbert Reed, Malcolm Muggeridge, James Burnham, Sidney Hook, Arthur Schlesinger, who take art history out of the story for, for a while and, and look at the sociological or the political or the spiritual influences um, on 20th century avant-gardism. And in the midst of this rather kind of inchoate research, I was sent an article by Eva Cockcroft, which was published in 1974, which turns out to be a, a seminal piece and the title was Abstract Expressionism, the CIA, a uh, weapon of the Cold War. And I figured, what on earth has Jackson Pollock got to do with Cold War politics? Um, to cut a long story short, I 
went ahead and made a documentary which investigated the rumour that there was more than just an implicit link between the success of abstract expressionism in Europe um, and indeed domestically and American foreign policy objectives during the Cold War. That's how I got into the story. Um, as in all documentaries, half of the really good material you have is on the cutting room floor and I felt that, uh, you know, I had the book already, I should just go ahead and write it and three years later I realised that was... Uh, astonishingly naive and uh, after spending a good part of you know one and a half to two years in archives in Abilene Kansas and your national archives here um, and just about everywhere else in the States I realized that I had a, a, a much bigger story than I had anticipated so I spent the next year and a half writing it and this is the result now what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to read uh, a, a talk which is um, really a kind of overview a precy of, of the claims of the book and also some of the questions that it raises. And I think then we can, we can go to some questions and, you know, if it's lacking in detail, uh, you know, please feel free to ask me to flesh that out. In the spring of 1966, the British poet Stephen Spender wrote a letter to Julius Fleischmann, patron of the Congress for Cultural Freedom and president of the Farfield Foundation. These two bodies were the publisher and financial arm, respectively, of Encounter magazine, of which Spender was co-editor. Both billed themselves as privately funded, independent organizations committed to promoting intellectual and artistic freedom. But rumors had been circulating at every literary cocktail party in London, Paris,